good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is Farid Jahshan from Arab Center, Washington, D.C., welcoming you to a webinar focusing today on Israeli elections 4.0, Israel's political crisis and impact uh, on uh, the Palestinians. Uh, judging basically from uh, the, the audience today, we have a large number of more than 350 plus uh, people have registered and it cuts across uh, geography. Uh, welcome to all from Tokyo, Japan, uh, all the way to Jerusalem and to Haifa and to Cairo and to Doha, to Kuwait City. Uh, we welcome all of you. We appreciate your support and your participation uh, in our events and we wish you a successful discussion uh, today. We hope to uh, shed some new light uh, on the Israeli elections. Uh, of course, there is the final results are not out yet, uh, but uh, as you know, uh, more than 4.4 million uh, Israeli voters, about 67.2% of all eligible uh, voters uh, in, in Israel went to the polls uh, yesterday uh, in an unprecedented uh, fourth uh, time, uh, for the fourth time in, in what, two years or less, to elect a new parliament, the 24th Knesset since 1948. Uh, with nearly 90% uh, of the vote counted, uh, the Likud uh, party has succeeded in keeping the, uh, the lead uh, with about 30 uh, Knesset seats thus far, almost twice as much as the 17th seat uh, secured by its next uh, competitor in line, Yesh Atid, uh, led by former journalist uh, Yair Lapid. Uh, although Netanyahu pulled a slightly better than expected victory, frankly, I mean, he was expected all along to get 28 to 29 uh, seats, so he got a little bit more. But uh, Likud, of course, continues to face a formidable uh, challenge in forming the next government, uh, since both uh, the right-wing alliance led by Likud and the left-wing opposition lack a clear and easy path. Uh, to a majority coalition to be able uh, to uh, govern. What is clear, however, is that Netanyahu is the most likely candidate to continue as prime minister of Israel, uh, barring, of course, any legal surprises awaiting him the next few months uh, in terms of the serious corruption charges uh, that he continues uh, to face uh, in Israeli court. But based on the results we have seen this morning, it is safe to conclude uh, several key points about Israeli politics in 2021 and beyond. First, I would say that the continued dominance of Likud-led right-wing parties in Israel for the foreseeable future will continue. That dominance is uh, undergoing both a quantitative and a qualitative surge with the addition of, of new elements, uh, Kahanis, uh, Jewish supremacist elements, uh, are part of the coalition now, and, and one would assume that they will play a part uh, in, in the new government. Uh, second, uh, corollary to that, uh, the erosion of the Israeli left and center is proceeding with little hope for significant change uh, expected soon. Third, the marginalization, uh, I would say, of, of the Palestinian Arab vote in Israel as Arab society splinters into uh, various communal, confessional, uh, ideological uh, camps, and, and definitely their numbers have dropped uh, at least uh, four seats uh, in the results we have seen today from the 15 uh, that they had uh, before during the last election. Fourth, uh, coalition politics that do dominated Israel since its establishment in 1948 and led to uh, governing paralysis, particularly over the past four or five years, is here to stay, it appears, and, and uh, there is no light, uh, at least I do not see a light at the end of this uh, dark tunnel, and we hope that our participants uh, will shed more light on that. Yesterday's election, ladies and gentlemen, was not a conventional election, even by Israeli standards. Uh, it was not open, dynamic uh, competition between uh, what we started with, 39 different lists, or parties submitting, uh, you know, or applying for permission to run uh, and competing over ideas, policies, platforms. Instead, this was a narrow referendum about Benjamin Netanyahu. It was essentially a battle between uh, what is known as the just BB camp and the never BB camp uh, over occupying the prime minister's seat. No serious debate 
uh, over the economy, which was surprising. Uh, no serious debate over foreign policy, over relations with Arab neighbors, uh, particularly new Arab neighbors uh, with new relations with Israel, with some uh, serious issues uh, now separating them. Uh, the recent conflict with Jordan and other uh, future relations with the Palestinians, future relations with the United States, uh, no serious debate about some of these vital uh, issues. So based on that, uh, my staff has already recommended to me this morning that we need to start planning for a future panel within a few months titled, entitled Israeli Elections 5.0, in the sense that uh, the estimate is that there will be a fifth election most probably over the next few months. Uh, to help us tackle these issues and other endless questions raised uh, by yesterday's elections, we are very fortunate and honored to have with us today an excellent panel of experts uh, with rich and varied experience with Israeli politics, from academia to activism to journalism, uh, uh, women's rights, minority rights, uh, and so on. I will introduce them in the order uh, that uh, they will uh, speak. Uh, we will uh, start today with uh, Tamir Sorek, uh, who is a liberal arts professor of Middle Eastern history uh, at Pennsylvania State University. Uh, he has, uh, uh, he's well known uh, for his expertise, uh, particularly on the uh, Arab citizens of, of Israel, has written a lot uh, on that over the years, but on, on Israeli politics in, in general. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Amal Jamal, who will be joining us in a few minutes. He's uh, uh, right now finishing his uh, lecture uh, in class, and he will be joining us in just a couple of minutes. He's professor of political science at Tel Aviv University. Uh, next will be Amira Haas, uh, Israeli journalist, uh, well recognized worldwide for her coverage as, as uh, are its correspondents uh, for the occupied uh, territories, her writings on, on the Palestinians are definitely unmatched and, and have been a good uh, resource for all kinds of experts uh, over the years. And last but not least, uh, my fellow Nazarene uh, <laughs> from the city of Nazareth, uh, Arin Hawari is joining us. Arin is uh, director uh, of the gender studies program at uh, Mada Al Carmel Arab Center for Applied uh, Social uh, Research uh, in Haifa. Each speaker will speak for about 12 minutes or so to be followed by a Q&A session uh, from the audience. Your questions are uh, welcome. And as customary at Arab Center Washington, most of you have attended our events in the past. Uh, it's done in writing. Please enter your brief questions uh, by pushing the Q&A tab at the bottom of your page. Uh, include, if you don't mind, your name, your affiliation, if any, and uh, the name of the panelists to whom it's addressed, uh, that will be uh, visible to me. And I will be more than glad to read your questions and direct it to the right uh, person uh, on the panel. Uh, with that said, uh, Tamir, the microphone is yours. Please activate your microphone and, and uh, we are ready to hear from you. <clears throat> Good morning, uh, uh, Khalil, and um, thank you for uh, inviting me. I thank you for the Arab Center and for the Institute for Palestine Studies to invite me. And thank you, uh, uh, Amira and Harin and uh, Amal uh, for sharing uh, with me this panel. Um, I, I watched yesterday uh, the uh, three channels of Israeli politics. Whenever people shout at each other, so I switch to the other panel so I can listen to people talking. Uh, and I would like to refer to three points, uh, three elements uh, that I think they are interconnected and they represent wider uh, processes. The first thing is that um, it looks like there is a growing legitimacy among at least some parts of the Israeli political spectrum for the inclusion of uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel in Israeli politics. Um, the first interviewee in one of the uh, channel was Mansour Abbas from the uh, uh, Arab United List. And this is a process that uh, maybe we can sign it in the, in the, already in the first intifada when the Zionist left understood that in order to fulfill uh, their dream about the so-called uh, Jewish democratic state, they need to collaborate with the uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel. And um, we saw ups and downs in this, 
There is no doubt that the assassination of Rabin was related to this. Actually, Igal Amir, who shot Rabin, said it explicitly that his concern was that the, uh, the Arab, uh, Arabs are deciding the, the fate of the state. Um, but in recent years, um, we see a growing legitimacy. Um, I, I think it is a question of survival of the uh, secular uh, Zionists. Um, in the last, uh, after the last elections, uh, the polls show that seven, between 70 and 80% of the supporters of the opposition parties were in favor of including the United List. So this is one uh, process that we see here. And the other process is seemingly contradicting this because what we see last night is the complete absence of the discussion of the Palestinians under occupation. They were not there. Uh, no reference to settlements, to the occupation, to the apartheid, to uh, one state solution, two state solutions. It was out of the, um, out of the spectrum. And uh, the last uh, thing, which is the exception of what I said now was Netanyahu's speech, because Netanyahu's speech referred to the potential international pressure that Israel might face. And twice in his speech, he referred to the international court and the need of uh, Israel to unite around this international pressure. So it is certainly something that concerns him. And he also understands that it might be a way um, to uh, uh, unite uh, certain elements of uh, Israeli politics uh, or Zionist politics around him. Now, how all these three elements are related? I think that what's happening in the, among the secular Zionist parts of the political map is that um, they understood their survival existential need in collaborating with the Palestinian citizens. But at the same time, they can do it only if they define the Israeli citizenship as the relevant boundaries of solidarity. Because once they extend it to beyond the green line, there is no Jewish majority. So um, they, they, they have to go on this line of embracing the Palestinian citizens of Israel without acknowledging that they are part of a broader uh, a ethno-national political community in uh, Palestine. Um, and, and this is a very delicate game that the uh, uh, Zionist, Palesti uh, Zionist secular uh, Israelis are trying to play. And I think it is an impossible game to play and, and because the, you, you can see at merits. The merit is shrinking and shrinking because um, they cannot find this narrow path between being both a Zionist and leftist. And um, in the long term, it's a, a vanishing world. Uh, this is what we call a Zionist left. Um, and, and now I, I would like to touch another element which is related because I think the main uh, X of Israeli politics at the moment is the struggle between the secular and the religious justification of Jewish supremacy. Um, and it, it, this is what happening now, because seemingly it's only about Netanyahu. Yes, baby, no baby. And seemingly the um, uh, anti-Netanyahu camp is so diverse and the pro-Netanyahu camp is diverse. But if you look at the voters of the parties who are against Netanyahu, the, let's call it the anti-Netanyahu uh, camp, um, they are overproportionately secular and this secularism is increasing with the years. Um, and the, um, the pro-Netanyahu camp is becoming more and more religious and with more and more emphasis on the need to make the state uh, working according to Jewish tradition and, and religion. I want to show you one graph um, that uh, illustrate that. I analyzed surveys from 2009. Um, let me share, the, share the, this. Um, okay, so this is what you see here, an analyzed survey from 2009 and from 2020, the beginning of the Netanyahu era. And this, uh, the, uh, the second one is from 
uh, the elections of last year, just after the election, during the elections and after the election. What you see here is that at the beginning of the Netanyahu era, 32% of the people who voted for the parties who supported Netanyahu, recommended him to be the prime minister, uh, thought that there, it's, it's definitely important that the government uh, uh, will make sure that Israel is conducted according to the Jewish religious tradition. And this percentage increased to 44% in 2020. Well, in the other camp, it declined from 11 to five. So what we see here, we see a polarization in, a, among Jewish voters regarding religion. And uh, it's partly related also probably to the emergence of the uh, uh, social media because it tend to polarize and we see it also. But also uh, there is a, a deeper element here. And the deeper element is the need of people in the pro Netanyahu camp to justify Jewish supremacy in religious terms. Why? If, because class-wise, they are in a much lower position. And this is another element. What we see with the years that education become, a, like in the United States, a stronger predictor of voting in Israeli elections. So in order to keep their privileges, voters of Netanyahu are more likely to stick to their Jewish identity and to demand a more and clearer identity of the state as a Jewish. The anti-Netanyahu camp are less, their, their privileges, they rely less on uh, the Jewish identity of the state. It does not mean that they do not aspire for Jewish uh, supremacy, but the justification they uh, require for it is different than uh, people in the other camp. So basically, um, we have here two, uh, um, uh, uh, two uh, dimensions of Israeli politics that interact with each, with each other is the question of what are the boundaries of uh, the political community? Um, to what extent uh, Palestinians are part or not part of, of this discussion? And this, I, I, unlike what sometimes uh, um, is reflected in the public discourse, it is not a linear process of marginalization of the Palestinian citizens of Israel. And on the other side, there is a very strong struggle over the place of religion in politics. I will just make two anecdotes here is that the two newcomer to the anti-Netanyahu camps, one is Lieberman, whose voters need secular marriage because many of them are not considered Jewish by the state. So the, the, he, he followed his voters toward the anti-Netanyahu camp in order to need the secular. And just anecdotally, Gidon Saar, it is not a coincidence that his daughter, it's, it's a gossip, but his daughter had a, an Arab boyfriend, okay? Now, it is, a, it, is, it is a gossip element, but it could not have happened for someone who is now in the pro Netanyahu camp when they are, um, they are embracing a neo-Nazi approach of being opposing uh, uh, any kind of racially mixed uh, uh, couples. This is part of significant part of the um, of the pro Netanyahu coalition. So I think I uh, completed my twelve minutes uh, that were allocated to me. So I will stop here and I will answer questions later. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Tamir. Uh, a lot of food for uh, thought here. So uh, we'll. Uh, I'm sure that will generate. Uh, some uh, interest in terms of the Q&A session uh, afterwards. Uh, we were expecting uh, Amal uh, oh, Jamal to join us in about a minute or two. Uh, I don't think Amal has joined us yet, correct? Uh, so let's go ahead and if you don't mind, uh, Amira, let's uh, oh, move uh, to you and then we will pick up with Amal as soon as he joins us. Uh, Amira will uh, shed uh, you know, some more light uh, from her perspective of someone who's covering the Palestinian side, uh, not just her comments on the Israeli elections, but also on their impact uh, on the Palestinian side, particularly in light of the expected uh, elections that are uh, coming soon uh, in, yeah. in Palestine. Yeah. Let me just um, make an announcement that I overlooked uh, earlier when I started the uh, 
uh, this webinar. Uh, this is a joint venture actually between Arab Center DC and the Institute of Palestine Studies. We are delighted to do that from time to time and we're looking forward to cementing uh, that relationship, particularly when it comes to issues pertaining to Israel and, and Palestine. So we welcome uh, our colleagues, our friends uh, from the Institute for Palestine Studies uh, and we look forward to uh, future events including uh, one uh, that's still being planned next week, uh, uh, sorry, next month, uh, about the elections in, in, uh, in Palestine. Uh, Amira, the, the microphone is yours. And thank you and hello to everybody. And thank you, Tamir. I always learn from you new things or see new angles. Uh, I'll zoom in to, to the big winners uh, as I see it in the West Bank. Uh, these are the two parties, one of, uh, it's called religious Zionism of Smotrich and Ben Gvir, the Kahanist, and the other one of Naftali Bennett Yamina. The uh, percentage of voters that they enjoyed in the settlements is much higher than what they got in the general public, Israeli public. For example, the settlement of Betel, which is nearby and my place here in Elbire and built on the lands of Elbire and Ramallah and other uh, Palestinian villages around. Uh, the Smotrich uh, party, the Smotrich and Ben Gvir party received 74% of their votes uh, up, uh, as, in in co as contrary to 5% in the general population. Bennett's party received around uh, 20 to 40 percent in different settlements, uh, which is a decline for him, uh, in comparison to six percent for uh, in the general public. So the power of these two parties, uh, we cannot calculate it only in in the general general uh, figures, as it is in the deep their deep involvement in anything that is happening in the, in the control domination over the West Bank, Palestinians in the West Bank, the space, the geopolitical situation in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. For me, these two uh, have been the, pra the, the, the government in practice, uh, the government de facto in the West Bank for very long. Uh, they are voters and they are elected uh, representatives have acted for many years in uh, uh, parties in, in uh, uh, so-called or, or apparently non-governmental organizations such as Gush Emunim or Regavim. Uh, and these organizations push the Israeli official authorities to act more against the Palestinian and to grab more of their land and resources. They also acted, these people, these elected and uh, voters, uh, acted as individuals uh, in order to maximize the interests, the accomplishment of the interests of the settlements. Uh, so they are not new in town, of course. And the interests are, as you can all uh, imagine, to expand, to enjoy, ever developing uh, infrastructure to uh, connect to Israel in roads and in the water uh, infrastructure, to attract more Israelis to live here, to create blocks of settlements uh, that those that are becoming kind of a, that it's becoming kind of a, a, a mantra in Israel that you cannot remove blocks of settlements and to advance to, uh, pre to uh, uh, annexation, de facto and de jure. Uh, they, are, they have been doing this through deep involvement in the offices of the civil administration, which is the arm of the Israeli government here in the West Bank. Uh, they are officials, they are uh, high officers, high uh, project projectors, they, they have mentors over uh, the civil administration. They are in the army, they are in the Shabak, they are in the police, they are in the, in the settlements uh, council, local councils, and in Israeli uh, normal um, uh, ministerial offices. So they are very, they are everywhere, 
uh, in every spot which decides about the fate of the West Bank. For sure, they will not have succeeded to do it if the, if the Israeli governments would not have sent them here and would not have allocated them with this mission. If the Israeli governments did not cling to colo the colonialist project and did not uh, initiate the, 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 the uh, uh, disconnection of the West Bank from Gaza, the Gaza Strip and disconnecting the uh, East Jerusalem from the rest. But the settlements knew all the time to uh, uh, initiate, to demand more and to, to influence more and more on more and more Israeli uh, publics in Israel proper. And the main, uh, the main, the main influence I see uh, in this process of the last 25, 30 years, which is parallel to the Oslo process, that the space that the whole world accepted as a Palestinian space that would be, that would, was supposed to turn into an Israel, into a Palestinian state. So that the space, which is Gaza, West Bank, including East Jerusalem, um, that had, had scattered Israeli enclaves uh, that has to be, that, ha that the world understood has to have to be removed. So this Palestinian space has turned over the 30 years into an Israeli space with Palestinian enclaves. This is the reality. All the Israeli governments since Rabin had a great part in it. And so it's clear it is a, it is a planned uh, 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 policy. It is not something that, that happens incidentally or because of some individuals wanted it. The role of the settlements here was to maintain, to make sure that the settlements remain small, uh, small as small as possible and as disconnected from each other. And this has worked for them. And when I say the settlers, I say exactly the same kind of people who now got these votes uh, in Yamina and uh, Sionut uh, Datit. So with no connection to the elections in Israel, the general elections in Israel, this is, these parties with the civil administration are the real government uh, in the West Bank. And when I say the real government, it's not on over the uh, settlers in, in, in the settlements, the Israeli citizens. Of course, they are the government over uh, uh, an uh, 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 in indigenous population, the indigenous population, Palestinian population that does not have the right to vote uh, and to choose the government that decides about such such important aspect of its life, uh, uh, and 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 future. So we see here a combination of continuity in the means and the goals of the Israeli regime, but also uh, a pushing to the extremes uh, of the of those means and the and the goals that the settlers that the settlers and the settler parties are uh, uh, are responsible for this. Um, one of the things that one of the initiatives of those uh, settler groups and organizations and uh, uh, and non-governmental non governmental organizations is to pass from construction to agriculture and from agriculture to the herding of uh, cattle and sheep uh, because they have realized that they don't get enough people uh, to move from Israel to the West Bank. So the area that they control remains relatively uh, uh, modest, not as, the, as much as they would like. So agriculture and even more so the herding of sheep and cattle uh, allows them to expand to larger areas, Palestinian areas, of course, all over the West Bank. Uh, and this is planned. This is planned and this is uh, 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 thought, this is well thought. And this cannot happen without a lot of violence. 
intimidation of, she of shepherds, intimidation of farmers. Um, this violence has always been here, the settlers' violence. And the settlers' violence uh, was always overlooked by the Israeli, uh, Israeli uh, institutions, law enforcement institutions. But now this violence is, is really much more organized. And it is not just a, a, an expression of supremacy, uh, of racism, it is strategic violence, uh, which is working, which is working. Israelis have been, you know, just prior to the elections, uh, there were some incidents that managed to shock some Israelis, but in general, everything which has to do with the uh, situation in Gaza and the West Bank, the Israeli domination over these two areas uh, is not part of the elections. Uh, occupation is a, is a word that deters Israel, uh, voters, so is the Hague. Um, and for me, it shows that the Israelis, including those uh, secular Zionists, have uh, wholeheartedly accepted the reality of the Palestinian enclaves uh, and accepted the lie that this is the end of the occupation because the Palestinian enclaves have their own government, uh, so-called government. And because the Israeli army is not in the Palestinian, uh, uh, not permanently in the Palestinian enclaves. So this, these enclaves are the real, um, the real uh, compromise, the Israeli compromise, internal Israeli compromise between a wish or a dream uh, or a, a goal that the Palestinians disappear and the understanding that right now uh, we cannot expel them, we cannot get rid of them, banish them. But here we have the two parties, and especially the one of Smotrich and Ben Gvir, that are openly uh, supporting the expulsion uh, under the guise of a test of lo a loyalty test that they want to uh, uh, pass to, to, to give to Palestinians. So if they are not loyal, they should leave. Um, 30, 40 years ago when Kahana, the, the, the spiritual father of Ben Gvir was, was in the Knesset, he was almost ostracized also by Likud. Today it's Netanyahu who wanted Ben Gvir to be in the, uh, to, 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 to uh, be elected to the Knesset. So not, in, not by accident, those two parties uh, are among the, or, or are always very happy when there is a chance for war. Uh, they are, uh, they have a role, they are supporters and they, some of their Knesset members, not all, have always had a, a, a military background, have a military background and they are proud uh, with the many religious uh, Zionists who are in the army now and getting higher in the ranks. Um, they want wars because wars can, may allow Israel and Israeli groups to do things such as massive destruction and expulsion, things that you cannot do so easily uh, in quieter days. Um, I see that their role, that their impact, influence in the West Bank, including Jerusalem, uh, and, and you all know how Jerusalem is also disseminated to, 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 to slums, disconnected slums, uh, that are terrorized by Israeli right wing. So their impact in these areas and the fact that they, uh, on the one hand, they, they implement an Israeli policy, but they also upgrade this policy. All this increases their power. And I see this as a very frightening, uh, very frightening, uh, prospect. They are very dangerous to all of us, but especially to the Palestinians. Uh, thank you, uh, Amira, for highlighting this very important uh, issue that's not quite uh, familiar to many of us, uh, being so far away uh, from uh, 
the field, if, if, if you will. Uh, Amira, if, if you don't mind, I might ask your camera somehow to, in the middle of your presentation, yeah, sure. drop down a little bit. So okay. we'd love to see your full face. <laughs> there you Here go, thank you very much. So let's go ahead now and, and move to our third uh, speaker, Arin uh, Awari, who is the director of the Gender Studies Program at uh, Madal Carmel in, in uh, Haifa. And she will also give us uh, her uh, reaction to the uh, elections uh, this time. And particularly, I guess, would be would love to hear from her about the uh, divisions uh, within the Arab community there in terms of, uh, of the vote pattern, and particularly with her focus on gender issues and, and the feminist movement, uh, if she could also uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, the role of uh, women in, in, in Israeli elections in general. Harin, the microphone is yours. Uh, if you don't mind turning the microphone on and yeah, proceed. Yeah, shukran. There thank you, Khalil. Thank you for the sure. other speakers. I'm happy to be here and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the new Israeli scene or what new is uh, in the Israeli elections. After that, I'll talk about, a little bit about the Palestinian politics, the parliamentarian politics in Israel. And I hope I will have time to talk about the feminist issues or, or dealing with the situation from feminist perspective, how feminist issues and values are used or actually abused within this uh, Israeli context. So I will start, uh, I, 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 as Amira already said, we, we see, and after the elections, we see we can talk about a raise of the power of the religious Israeli parties, the religious Zionist parties, and the religious Haredi, and the Haredi parties who became ally of the, the Likud and specifically Netanyahu in the recent years. We are talking now also about a new versions of, or the new generations of, uh, of right in Israel. It's not only the religious settler right that we are, we know it's, but also the Kahanist one. It's not only the apartheid right, but also the transferist right is becoming. They they were all the time. They existed all the time, but now they are becoming legitimate in the Israeli scene as part that could be part of the uh, Israeli uh, government. Uh, the Kahanist parties were out of legitimacy in Israel, not only according to the left. Zionists in Israel, and not only according to the center of the Israeli parliamentarian scene, they were illegitimate also according to the Likud in Israel. I just heard Limor Livnat before some days in an interview, she said how she remembers when Kehana entered some place, some of the Israeli Likud leaders used to leave the, the, the place. So we can imagine a uh, what are we talking about? Which Israel we are talking about in 2001? And, and within actually within the Israeli context now, we are not seeing, you don't see, um, as Tamir said, we don't see like a, any, any discourse, any advertisements, any discussions over the occupation because they already finished everything. The Israel controls everything. There's, there is no need to discussion. They, the Palestinians are silenced. They don't need to discuss, the, even to discuss these things. So we are, we, we look, we are looking, we can talk about a competition as Dr. Muhammad Mustafa said of, of different versions or different kinds of, of right. Is it the ideological right or the institutional right or the populist right or the Kehanist right? It's different versions of right. Uh, within the, I, and, and within it's it's very clear within the all the hegemonic right in uh, context in Israel they they all agree all of them they all agree over the settle keeping the settlements or increasing the settlements the siege on Gaza the idea of the nationality law even if they do not agree with the details of nation Israel as a nation state law they all agree of this concept and of these values. So the result of the Israeli question, Israel elections now, it could be in any constellation, it will be a right uh, wing um, government. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about the Zionist left in Israel, also called Zionist left, and then I'll talk about Palestinian uh, politics. Uh, uh, again, with um, 
the, all the Zionists left in Israel are part of the Zionist hegemonic discourse to talk about Israel as a Jewish state and to defend and to protect Israel. I will cite just two leaders of the of the Zionist parties, and then I will talk about the way they view the Arabs, the, the right and the left. Amir thought that it is like we are becoming more legitimate in Israel. I'll talk about it. But just let me cite Mirav Michaeli, the head of the Labour Party, who is viewed as a new generation in the Labour Party, a new leader. She's known as feminist in, within the, in the Israeli context. And she succeeded to bring a feminist Palestinian woman to be part of her party. Uh, uh, Mirav just said the decision of the High Court, uh, uh, the court in Hague, is difficult and problematic. The court exercised power that was not within its authority and imposed them on the Israeli. It was in a way that distorted the situation and that she said that she is um, uh, proud of the Israeli court and the Israeli uh, military, as she calls it, uh, Sahel. So this is uh, the head of the Israeli Labour Party that everyone said that she's a left and a feminist woman. Yair Gulan, the candidate number three, and Meris. Uh, again, the leftist party in Israel, he just said, I served 38 years in Sahel. I was shot in the battle. It is possible that I will be interrogated for my security work in Hague. So I won't accept any preaching over my Zion, over Zionism from a racist right who did not do what I did, a little of what I did. Like he's proud of what he did and he's proud that he will be um, investigated in Hague. So this is what, the third leader of the Zionist leftist party. Not, uh, not to mention uh, that also um, the, the second one, what's her name? I just... Uh, um, What's her name, the second uh, candidate of merit? Uh, no, no, no problem, I will, I will I remember. I don't have the list in front of me. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, what's her name? I missed the name now. Okay, so she I'm said... Sorry. Yeah, yeah, Tamar, Tamar, I'm sorry, Tamar Zandberg. Yeah, yeah, she just said... Uh, uh, the, the, she was afraid that merits will fall down. So she said if, if merits didn't fall down, merits will uh, will support and will protect and uh, all the the all the all the gauche all the, the the group like she means all the other group not netanyahu so she feels herself part of all the others and she is talking about being she was talking before the elections about being part of the of the government. So she is not even talking about being opposition. She wants to be part of the not Netanyahu coalition. In any constellation, the not Netanyahu co coalition is a right coalition, of course, and she wants to be part of it. I, I want to talk a little bit about the way the Zionist left see the Arabs and why they become legitimate, or even with, also with Netanyahu. It's not that we became legitimate. We, we were all the time legitimate as long as we don't have our national project. And like, historically, the Arabs was, it's the new generation who that, that you don't view the Arabs within the, the Zionist parties. They were all the time in the Zionist party, but we are without our national project. That what is in you now? That that they like they use um, um, a new a new figures that we can we used to see them in other civil society we used to see them in our as colleagues this is in you but and and they I will I will talk about merits merits is very well known in Israel as a secular party. Half, more than half, most of its uh, program and its slogans talking about individual rights, sexual rights, uh, dividing state and uh, and religion. This is the 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 project of merits. But when it comes to Arab, it's they, uh, the Arabs are not. They don't have to be secular. They don't have to talk about individual rights at all because they are not coming. They are not present, representing human rights. They are not presenting sexual rights. They are not presenting secular rights. They are representing the Arabs. So you can be whoever you are. Once Hasni Jbara was representative of the Arabs in Meretz, the leftist party, and she did she she said that she does not agree of any change in the personal status law and the religious conservative personal status law in Israel. 
Tufiq Khatib once was a member of Islamic movements, and when he left the Islamic movement, he made, he made a lie, Halaf, with Meris. You cannot imagine that any of the religious parties in Israel would be a lie with Meris because they don't think uh, uh, alike. But when you are Arab, anyway, you are really, you are filling the, the place of the Arab. You are not filling, I mean, according to the racist approach of merits, the secular party, the party who, who talks about liberal rights. And now the same with Ghaida Rinawi, even though now you are talking, taking the new generation, civil society activists, Ghaida Rinawi feels very, very relaxed when she talks about her opposition to, to, to supporting sexual rights, not sexual rights, to supporting the law that does not agree of making, changing the, 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 the gays, uh, changing their, uh, like their uh, orientation. She said, I won't agree with that. Why she does not agree with this? Because she is part of her community. She said, I'm part of my community. I'm part of my society. As if our society, you know, is a strict society that cannot be changed and we had no dynamics in this community. And as if we are like only conservative community, and but but it's not the way only the way she views her her uh, community or her society but it's the way it's it, the, that she has all the okay the permission from marriage to say whatever she wants only to bring or to 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 bring um uh votes to the elections uh, i will do i have three four okay. minutes to talk about other parties okay oh, shukran oh. I'm sorry. You know, it's it's very strange and very difficult to talk. Uh, Khalil presented me as an academic, but I am talking now not only as academic and mainly not as an academic. I'm talking about uh, as a, a Palestinian activist, um, political activist. Like it's the first time that I see, and and even if if I as an as a researcher, I would never have this analysis. I would not ex never expect the reverse that we are feeling and we feel as uh, as Palestinians in our national project in our in our political project after 20 years of hegemonic discourse over the state of its citizens over hegemonic discourse that we our case as Palestinian in Israel Palestinians in Israel did not start six, uh, it started in 48 the issue of occupation and Israel is the his crimes did not start in 67, it started in 48. So the, our point of reference is 48 and next 67. And we are as Palestinians, not part of the Palestinian case and we are part of the solution. This is the, the political discourse the new Palestinian generation brought 20 years before. After this, this context, this hegemonic uh, discourse now, and after the joint list specifically, at, at the time that Israel in the climax, let's say, of the fascism and the Gehanism, we see that the, the joint list that was like all the time the objective of Balad, we will have one, uh, one joint list for all the Palestinians, uh, instead of having uh, like to, to make it higher the ceiling, we are we are having the opposite exactly. You can we can see it started by recommending Gantz in the, the elections before. And now we we continue to see it. All the slogans, all the advertisements of the, the joint list. I mean Jabha and Tajammu, Balad and the Democratic Front, they talk only about not Netanyahu. Like if you say only not Netanyahu, so we can compete with every other Zionist party. I get every day, me and all the others, messages from Yair Lapid, from Merit, from, uh, the, from even Netanyahu, Abu Yair, who talks about, I will solve the problem of the crime in the Arab community. I will, will change the cabinets. Uh, Yair Lapid sent us, we will change the cabinets, the, the law that talks about home house demolition. That means if you are talking about only civil discourse, if the Palestinian case is not existing in the, in the, in the project of the, the joint list, then we can compete with all the Zionist parties. They can give us the same discourse of, of a joint list. Within this situation and within this context, I don't see what is happening with Mansour Abbas. I mean, from the uh, Southern Islamic movement, it's strange. It's not strange because 
if we started to recommend the Gantz, who is not less than Netanyahu in, in his uh, view, political view and his army history. So it's what Abbas Mansour is doing is not very, like, it's not very strange. I just want to say that uh, if, because I don't know the audience, who, what, what does the audience know? Abbas Mansour not only did not mention any of the, of the political national agenda that I don't even expect from him, uh, he was just he was just interviewed in the morning in uh, I think in Rashid Beit in the Israeli TV uh, radio. They asked him, "What do you say about Netanyahu, who said that he is not considering any not Zionist party?" Uh, then he answered, "No, but he is in the in the coalition with um, he's in the coalition with the Haredim who are not Zionist party." And then they asked him, "Can you say what you think of Zionism?" And he said. You know, after uh, I didn't sleep at night, I cannot talk about political and philosophical politics. It's a, it's a question of philosophy. Zionism, each student of each child of fourth a class can talk about Zionism, about Zionist project. He didn't say anything about the Zionist project. Within all the uh, its campaign to the to the elections, you did not hear, you cannot find any word about Al-Aqsa. Not to mention all Palestine, Al-Aqsa. It's the most sacred place for all the Muslims and for the Islamic movements. They didn't mention Al-Aqsa. You know what they mentioned? And then, and here I will talk a little bit about the, the feminist and the, the, the misuse of the feminist issue. They talked only about their opposition to the sex, so-called secular party, parties in, in issues of sexual rights because they, we, they are against the gays. And they thought that in this, so this is the niche that they can talk about and protect. As always, if you talk about against sexual rights, against women, against feminist issues, you can gain the, the community and the people and the votes as long as you don't have national project, as you don't have anything else but this. Within that, this context, I'm very sorry to say that we see the fifth woman, the fifth candidate in the Islamic movement woman. Now we have four, three, four, five maybe women in the Knesset but lacking our feminist issue and our feminist agenda and lacking the, the gender perspective, gender approach. And again, because of the incitement against the gays, we find a woman, uh, the fifth representative of the Islamic movement. Uh, again, uh, you know, uh, the last, I know I, I, it's not my time. I hope in the, in the discussion to answer about uh, more issues about women's politics and representation. But one thing I want to say, as a feminist activist in a party, part of Balak party, I am very used to be criticized uh, as Jabha and Tajamma, Balad and the Democratic Front, that we don't support the, the, the gays, the LGBT rights. You know what now, if you talk to the LGBT activists, they don't expect us to support them. They just ask the politics, the Palestinian politics, please don't use us and don't incite against us in your campaigns. So this is what they expect from us. Last but not least, I think if we want to defeat Netanyahu and to defeat the fascism and the, the Kahanism in Israel, we should confront Israel as a settler colonial project. We, could, we should have the go with solidarity with the international solidarity with anti-Zionist Jews, taking all the social pro, pro, social rights and individual rights and not to like to withdraw, I mean, as a so-called secular parties against the Islamic parties when it comes to social and feminist rights. And thank you. I'm sorry for taking more time. No, that, that's fine. Thank you, Arin. Uh, again, you raised quite a few issues. I hope they will generate uh, additional uh, questions for verif verifying uh, some uh, of these facts that uh, uh, you uh, mentioned somewhat in a hurry. So hopefully we'll have a little more time uh, to explore these. Uh, okay, let's uh, go ahead and start with the uh, Q&A uh, session. We have uh, several questions already. Uh, received. Uh, the first one is from our good friend, uh, Paul uh, Sham, who's uh, a professor of Israeli studies at the University of Maryland, and it's addressed to Tamir. Uh, Paul would like, uh, he said basically first, uh, excellent analysis. He, he liked your presentation. And uh, he says that you seem to see politics as driving religion among BB voter, voters. Uh, while I think the dynamic is the other way around, 
uh, that is more dangerous, which is why BB's own plans are moderate compared to them. When BB is finally gone, don't you think the political leadership of the right will pass to the religious right, uh, thus creating even more societal and diplomatic frictions? Your thoughts are appreciated on that. Hello, Paul. Uh, good to see you uh, virtually. Um, I, I think it's, uh, it goes both ways. And uh, there is a mutual feeling of uh, Netanyahu's personality and the uh, religiosity of his camp. And I have no doubt that once uh, Netanyahu disappears, the uh, uh, fight over the place of uh, religion uh, in the uh, ideological justification of the uh, Israeli regime will remain there. Netanyahu is not the cause of that, is um, only an embodiment of a very uh, a deep uh, processes, uh, sociological and political processes. So I agree with you. Uh, thank you, uh, Tamir. Uh, the next question uh, uh, is from George Tawil and it's addressed to Amira. Uh, uh, does it really make any difference to the Palestinians in the West Bank who wins the elections or forms the next government in Israel? More settlements and violence uh, was committed by labor than Likud, after all. Amira? Um, yes and no. Uh, um, it's true that, you know, when we talk about Netanyahu and we concentrate on one, uh, one person or one, one party or similar, we forget that, the, that there is, as Arin said, <clears throat> it is a project, and because, because unlike in Israel, uh, the Palestinians, the, 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 the victims of the uh, uh, early, I mean, or the, 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 the initial Israeli colonialist project, <clears throat> but they are citizens. So they are protected by some, in some aspects, in a way that the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza are not. So there, it makes a difference if we have more Kahanists in the government or if we have even people like Yair Golan. Um, and it's, it's, you know, like it's being pragmatic, but it's being pragmatic about uh, 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 things which are crucial. Um, the 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 uh, most of the most of the leaders of the Israeli Zionist parties, secular parties, and not, not which are not considered extreme right wing, have a military background, and I wouldn't, uh, uh, and I'm sure that they killed more Palestinians than any Palestinian uh, life prisoner uh, in Israeli uh, jails. What's important is they are uh, they are public. They, what's important is the people who support them and how they envision some uh, 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 the future uh, and the reality. Um, so they, when you have people who support expulsion, when you have more people who support expulsion, more representatives who support expulsion of Palestinians, uh, uh, expulsion out of the country, or concentrating more Palestinians in their enclaves, um, it might succeed and it might come to an ir irreversible uh, 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 points. What we learned during the second intifada that it can get worse. And when it gets worse, is not, it, it does not open uh, 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 the window to a better, uh, a better chance. It really gets worse. So, there is a difference. There is a difference. And I think that's why uh, it's difficult because the, 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 the Israeli, Israeli uh, uh, center has gone very much to the right wing. And uh, if in the, in the eve of the Oslo process, you felt there was a <clears throat> great group of Israeli peaceniks, not leftists, but people who understood that they, we have to, in order to think of another future, we have to come to terms with the Palestinian minimal demand for a, for a state in the 67 occupied territory. 
not because it is ideal for the Palestinians, but because it, it leashes out another process, which is a more, which is a, a, a contradictory to the process of wars and of annexation. But there was a, a, a great group of Israelis who, who, who indeed supported it. So what happened is that we, that, that, that they are, they are leaders, Likud and uh, 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 labor, the labor leaders cheated on them uh, in a very cunning way, a very cunning way. So they used the Oslo process, the Oslo negotiations that I, I myself opposed to it from the start because I saw the, 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 mm -hmm. the cheat behind it. But there, were, there was a big battalion of Israeli or big division of Israeli, whatever we call it, who wanted to see a, a end of occupation in 67. And really a Palestinian state and didn't mind if the settlement, settlements would have been uh, dismantled. Um, so it does matter, it does, it does make a difference. It does make a difference because I, um, I am afraid of the worst scenarios. Uh, and I see that when, whenever we have a government which is more, more to the right wing and more uh, religiously motivated, the expulsionist uh, 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 agenda and vocabulary are much stronger and can be realized. Uh, thank you, Amira. This is one of the kind of uh, almost permanent uh, questions in, in Arab-Israeli uh, matters, particularly on the Palestinian uh, issue uh, that continue to be, that question continues to rise again and again and again, so 72 years uh, after the establishment of the State of Israel. Uh, is there or, you know, showing that there is a discrepancy in the, in the full understanding uh, of the difference between different factions in Israel and the same thing on the Israeli side, uh, misunderstanding of differences uh, within the different camps uh, on the Palestinian side. It's one, one aspect of the continuing tragedy there that we have to continue to raise the same uh, question again and again. But uh, at any rate, let's move to the next question. It's from David Abraham. And uh, this one is to Arin. Uh, you did mention in your presentation uh, some of the issues pertaining to Meretz's uh, uh, position and uh, some of the uh, racism on the, on the left, if you will, uh, the left platform for Jewish voters, but uh, will accept uh, Arab voters uh, as a necessary compromise in order to build a mixed Palestinian Jewish party. Uh, but the joint list also has tried to have progressives and conservatives uh, kind of coexist uh, together when, within uh, the movement. So this is kind of common to all the different uh, groups, correct? Uh, microphone. Sorry. Yeah, I agree that within the Palestinian uh parties, so-called secular parties, we have also conservative and also progressive, but this is my criticism over my party and my, the Palestinian parties. Of course, I disagree with that. It's my, uh, that's why we, uh, we, we are all the time uh, criticizing our, our political parties, but at least they do not pretend present themselves as the LGBT supporters or as the feminist support, supporting the, all the feminist agenda all the time. Actually, no, they were all the time, we, we work on politics and the negotiations with our parties towards these issues. But the difference is that merits its, its main agenda. Its first agenda, is, uh, its basic agenda is talking about these individual rights. Like in our party, in our parties, I mean, we all the time negotiate, like let's say sexual rights or personal status rights. But as for merits, it's their mandate. So I would understand that Palestinian would leave that, that I won't understand, of course, but I won't accept, but I would understand as an analyst, let's say, and an, an, that Palestinian would leave the Arab parties because they, she or he agrees with their secular uh, individual rights agenda, liberal agenda. But as a Palestinian to go to merits and talk about 
not to talk about their social agenda. So why are you talking to talk about their, sec their Jewish state or about their, the history of Yair Golan in military? Like, why are you, are you as Palestinian there? So of course, I agree that we are negotiating with our parties, but this is the way politics uh, works. All right, thank you, uh, Arin. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Amal, uh, Jamal. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, and uh, what we would like to do, we, we did already start the Q&A because your colleagues uh, finished their presentation. So if you don't mind, we'll give you the next 12 minutes uh, to make your presentation. Uh, as I said earlier in introducing uh, the speakers, Amal is professor of political science uh, at Tel Aviv University, and uh, we welcome his uh, reaction uh, to the tentative uh, Israeli election results uh, from yesterday. And uh, if he could uh, particularly focus also on uh, not just the general results of the election, but specifically on what happened uh, to the Arab vote uh, uh, yesterday, whether that is a, uh, a long-term change or a temporary kind of uh, setback. Uh, for uh, the Arab community in Israel. Dr. Amal, please, Fadda. Uh, uh, hi, everybody. I'm, I'm terribly sorry there, there had been a, a misunderstanding. I thought we start now. Uh, in the coordination uh, conversations, I spoke about 6 p.m. my time because I just finished teaching now. So I'm, I'm sorry that uh, there has been a misunderstanding. Anyways, no uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm terribly sorry, Tamir and Arin and everybody else, uh, Amira, that I missed your talks. Uh, uh, anyways, I, I have uh, three, three, four insights to, uh, uh, to say. One is, I, I think uh, what the Israeli political system is facing now is a, is a result of a long-term processes taking place in Israeli society. Uh, that we can reduce them into uh, the, the problem uh, facing Benjamin Netanyahu now, but it's not a personal issue only. I think uh, the political system in Israel has been facing uh, polarization processes that uh, are, are actually translated uh, in these elections as well as in the previous uh, three elections, uh, boycotting uh, each other. And the boycotting, of course, is concentrated on, on one personality as if he is the only problem. I think the ability to uh, lead to a stable uh, 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 maj uh, majority coalition is much larger than uh, Netanyahu's uh, uh, place in the system, saying that if Netanyahu leaves tomorrow, the question is, will there be uh, uh, a stable coalition for a long time. And in my view, it's going to be uh, 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 not as much, but still problematic uh, because the problems are much deeper than, than one person and uh, the differences are, are, uh, are, are very, very uh, long standing. Uh, and the fragmentation taking place, uh, reflecting actually the social processes, the deeper social processes in the Israeli. Uh, society uh, uh, and are translated into the institutional system uh, via, you know, 40 parties running for elections, three or four people running for the prime ministership, uh, so many small parties, uh, you know, uh, putting, uh, trying to squeeze the government or squeeze the uh, prime minister in order to gain uh, whatever possible for their own communities. This is one one point. The second point, I think part of this is actually uh, what's going on with the Arab parties or the place of the Arab parties uh, in, in the Israeli political system. I think this is, this is uh, the first time uh, we see that uh, uh, both camps in Israel, the conservative nationalist camp and the liberal uh, national camp, fully understand that without the Arab parties, they uh, will not be able to rule for a long period of times. Meaning that the Jewish society is split almost in the middle and fragmented to an extent that uh, it will be almost impossible for any of them to uh, 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 build a, a coalition 
a lasting coalition or a stable coalition for a long period of time. And uh, I think the, the person who was able to uh, read this situation is uh, Mansour Abbas, is, is the Islamic party. Uh, and uh, he is not introducing uh, uh, something new into the system. Uh, the, 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 this tactic of negotiating with, uh, with, the, uh, with the Jewish parties, with Zionist parties, in order to uh, promote or represent, uh, enhance the uh, uh, basic rights of the Palestinian citizens has been part of the system uh, from its beginning. Uh, the, the issue is that their negotiations was, limit, were lim uh, was limited only to the uh, uh, center left uh, part of the political system and opening this uh, strategy tactic to both sides of the political system is something new. <clears throat> I think something that uh, 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 wishes to maximize the impact of the Arab community on the Israeli political system, uh, saying that uh, without uh, taking us into consideration, it would be impossible for any of you to build a coalition. And since we are not loyal to any of, uh, uh, of, both, uh, of both camps, and we are willing to go with any, uh, it changes the entire uh, political game. And uh, I, I think we have to take uh, this into consideration. And here I would like to say that the numbers uh, don't play much role here. In the sense, the, the, the joint list was composed of 15 seats in the last elections. Uh, and as a result of not willing to play this game, and to be loyal to one camp only or negotiate with one camp only, the number didn't play, the big number didn't play any uh, role. Uh, the, uh, the joint list was not effective in the system the way the, <coughs> uh, the uh, Arab community wished it to be. Now, with four seats or five seats, the Islamic party, Ram, is able to play this game as a result of the shift in its positioning within the system, which means sometimes uh, systematically in, this, in such systems, uh, a small number is able to gain more than big number according to, of course, the willingness or the ability to play, to change the rules of the game and, and uh, play according to uh, uh, a new game that you as a small party can impose on the uh, system. Uh, does that mean that the Arab community actually wished for such a strategy? Uh, and, and I have to pose the question, if the, this was uh, wished for by the entire Arab community, how come the uh, joint list did not reflect this uh, sentiment? Uh, and uh, if this is, if this was the, uh, wish of the Arab community, how come they did not uh, vote more for uh, Mansour Abbas and his party? Uh, I think these questions have to be answered. And, and my, my answer, my brief answer is that uh, the Arab community wants to be part of the game, but with certain limits, with certain uh, rules, with certain uh, uh, red lines. And uh, uh, the average of voting in the Arab community, I think, reflects this very well. If we look at the four uh, last uh, rounds of elections, in April 19, uh, uh, 2019, uh, there, were two, there were two parties, uh, a different constellation than uh, this time, but still two parties. The average uh, uh, participation in the Arab community was around uh, 52%, 53%. Uh, in September, when the joint list, when the two parties joined, uh, the average participation went up 6%. Again, in March 20, when the joint list uh, 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 appeared to be a, a, a good player and appeared to unite the Arab voice and Arab vote, and maybe become effective in the system, uh, 
the March 20 elections brought another two seats to the uh, joint list, meaning uh, another 5% uh, in the average of participation in the Arab community, which means the Arab community has marked to the joint system, the uh, joint list, what exactly it wants. Uh, they wanted actually more seats in order to be more effective in the system. I, I'm not saying that they actually all wanted uh, the joint list to do what Mansour Abbas is doing now, but actually they wanted this direction. They wanted a new uh, uh, rules of the game. They wanted a new discourse. They wanted more uh, uh, innovative a form of politics that will enable the, uh, the joint list to be more effective in the system. The problem is twofold. One, uh, that there are ideological parties within the, uh, the joint list that we were, not, we were not willing to go that far. And they were forced to do so. Uh, when, when it came up to uh, recommending uh, Benny Gantz to uh, prime ministership, we saw the split within the joint list. And as a result of the mechanism of majority rule within the list, they managed actually to deny the voice and recommend uh, Benny Gantz. Two parties within the joint list were not satisfied. One, uh, Balad, which did not want to go that far. Uh, and the second is uh, Ram and uh, uh, Masur Abbas among them is that going automatically to Benny Gantz is problematic. We are willing to recommend, but not automatically Benny Gantz. Why not play the game in the middle? It could be much more effective. And uh, of course, it didn't happen. They recommended Benny Gantz. Benny Gantz did what he did. And the differentiation between the positions became very clear. That's why I think that's what made uh, Mansour Abbas go for splitting the, the, the joint list, uh, that if the community votes, votes for us that uh, strong and commits itself to the joint list, the joint list can play, can, can actually respond to the expectations within the community only by taking an impartial position between the two camps in order to be able to squeeze as much as possible. Now, <clears throat> I think that the situation today changed a little bit. That's what brings critique on Mansour Abbas. Imagine a situation that uh, Yesh Atid had 25 or 26 uh, seats in the Knesset and the ability of the Arab parties to determine which camp uh, is the one to go with uh, uh, is open, uh, th uh, hypothetically, theoretically, it would have been uh, much better than the situation that Mansour, Mansour Abbas finds himself uh, in now. Mansour Abbas actually chose the right strategy, but the end result will be very, very problematic for our community because he also is in a situation that he can go with only one party. The, the balance of power within the system is such that uh, the right-wing parties have a bigger majority and very much united and have more chances in the case he supports them, has more chances to form a coalition. According to his last uh, talks today, uh, the, the, the things he said, uh, one could interpret uh, his, his, uh, uh, his discourse uh, as if trying still to keep the two options open, that he is willing to think any option uh, and go with any option possible. In my view, the option to go with the center left is not possible and therefore he is left with an option which is also problematic. Last comment uh, about the remaining joint list. I think the remaining joint list lost for two main reasons. One, the split. Uh, people thought that, uh, did not actually accuse Mansour Abbas alone in the split within the, uh, the joint list. I think part of the public were aware of the way the relationship within the list 
uh, took place for the last uh, year or, uh, or more and did not trust very much what's happening in the joint list. Therefore, uh, uh, the split within it caused uh, uh, very much uh, resentment and, and, uh, and uh, uh, mistrust uh, among the public. This is one thing. And then the other thing, the other reason is that the, joint, the current joint list did not manage to uh, bring a new voice into the system. Having Masur Abbas as a challenge, they should have not only reacted to his own strategy, they should have brought constructively a completely new strategy that actually reinstitutes the whole political game. And they did not manage to do so. They were caught in a vicious circle of re responding to Mansour Abbas and, uh, and without a new hope for the public, the public stayed home. That's why we see the reduction or the, the retreat in the, in the numbers of the, of the current joint list. This leads us to a situation where, you know, in, in the best situation, structural situation possible for the Arab parties, for the Arab community, to have the major impact possible on the Israeli political system, I think the Arabs have missed uh, the opportunity uh, to do so. Uh, uh, the Arab leadership, I think, has to uh, uh, look uh, very critically on what happened in the last uh, year and reorganize the entire uh, political, uh, Arab political system in order to better understand what's going on Israeli and uh, uh, enable uh, uh, better impact on uh, on the system this doesn't mean by the way going as far as abbas is willing to go i don't think that the sentiment of the public is not necessarily there but the public is expecting new uh, new language new uh, methods new uh, vision uh, in order to open the horizon for better impact on the system Thank you very much. I hope I didn't take much. much Thanks, time. Amal. Appreciate it. Uh, Arin, did you want to add something? Yeah, no, I was wanted to ask Amal, Professor Amal Jamal. He said, like, it doesn't have to be as far as, uh, as Abbas, but could this be as far as Jabha and Tajama when they recommended Gans? Is this what you mean? Or please explain. Well, I, I think uh, uh, going well, the, these are diff two different situations. Uh, I, I think, yes, uh, the, the, the automatic uh, response to recommend uh, guns without making sure that he is going with them was a, a strategic mistake. They did not take into consideration the possibility that guns may not meet the expectation and do what he, he, he did. Uh, this, uh, mis this is a, for me, is a misreading of what's going on in the system. And this says a lot about how the Arab leadership is playing in the Israeli political system. The fact that they, uh, you know, are in the system does not mean that they really understand what's going on in the system. And they are not cautious enough in the system. Because if they had made sure that uh, uh, negotiating with Gantz before recommending him fast in order to strike a deal fast and then recommend, Otherwise, we don't recommend. This would have opened the game for a completely different uh, uh, options. They did not do so. And now Mansour Abbas finds himself in a similar situation that he doesn't have an option in the center left uh, because of the disparity within this camp between Lieberman and, and Meretz, between, uh, between uh, uh, Saar and the uh, and, uh, Labour Party and so on and so on. So he is actually left in the same situation, which is problematic. Although he speaks as if he is willing to negotiate with everybody, structurally, his options are limited. And I think this is uh, uh, also reflecting the same problem. My, 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 uh, my conclusion would be uh, is that <clears throat> the Arab community, as long as they go to the, to the Knesset, they have to be open to play the rules according to the rules of the game. And I think they are gaining enough power. And now after they were legitimized by the right wing, by Netanyahu and so on and so on, who, who may change his discourse immediately after he forms a government, we know that. But still, 
the fact that he became Abu Yair and the fact that he speaks, spoke the way he spoke and uh, uh, Lapid followed the lead and other parties followed the lead and, and people are open for cooperation with Arab parties. I think reuniting the, the, the joint list or finding a new coalition. And I always said and wrote it, that the joint list is not <laughs> sacred. <laughs> the joint list is only a tool in order to promote Arab politics. And the moment you go to the Knesset, I think if you don't understand the rules of the game and are able to play according to uh, uh, the options available in the system, by the way, with not, without forgetting that we are Palestinians, that there is a Palestinian problem, but that the issue, when you have enough power, not only to get allocations of money in order to solve a, a problem here and there, but to change the entire policy, because 15 seats could have actually changed a lot in Israeli politics, and not only allocation of resources, changing the entire orientation of the system. This should be actually the aspiration for the Arab parties. And the openness of the system now for such an option and the structural uh, split within the Israeli Jewish society, I think open new opportunities that the Arab parties have to be able to uh, utilize for their own, their own uh, interests, their own rights, and uh, reshift the entire direction of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the ship. And it's possible in my view. Okay, the, if that is possible, uh, Amal, and the question I would like to address to Arin and, and to you uh, from Samir uh, Shahabi, uh, is what happened uh, with regards to uh, Mansour Abbas here and, and possibly uh, implying that he might be joining or dealing uh, directly with Netanyahu uh, and, and, and Likud, is this a change in Palestinian uh, per perspective? Is it a detachment? Uh, if you will, from uh, the 48 Palestinians, from their count, their their fellow Palestinians in in the West Bank uh, and Gaza, is it more assimilate sign of assimilation, or is it simply a different approach than the approach that is solely based on achieving your rights uh, in Israel? Um, thank you. I, I will. Yeah, I will answer this question. I just want to relate to Amal is. Uh, what Amal said, I just want to say my my attitude. I think the mistake of recommending, it's much more than mistake, but I don't find the word in English, khati'a, it's not khata, of recommending it's sin. Gang, it's, it's sin. sin, yeah. Yeah, sin. It's not uh, like, it's not a, a, a strategic or, or a, a, a failure or mistake in how we, we make politics. I think it's a moral uh, failure. It's a moral mistake. It's a, a political from my national and human rights. When I say national, I don't mean national general. I mean, as a Palestinian who has a, a just and uh, and the human rights issue as Palestinian, I cannot never, we should never recommend um, against because he's not political. He's not different than Netanyahu. This is this one is corrupt and this one is not corrupt for, formally. I don't know. This is hey, the but, problem. But, but now I, now you have a member of that coalition who wants to recommend Netanyahu, who's a lot worse than Gantz. He's not necessarily better. Yes, this, this is what I want to say, that I yeah. think that the process that started with this sin of recommending a one like Netanyahu or a three generals of, of war uh, party, let us, we give the, just the legitimacy, I think, by recommending guns to Netanyahu, because who said this is better than that? This is corrupt one man, this is not corrupt man, but this is, but politically they are not different. In all the issues, the sawabit al Palestinian, our beliefs as Palestinians, they, they do not differ at all. So I think it's not only how the way we make politics, and I don't think if we, as Amal said, we, it's a discussion all the time to go to the parallel Israeli parliament, to the Knesset, or not to go. But at least as the way I view myself and my party, Balad, that was, I was part of establishing this party, we didn't go to the Knesset. I remember Azmi Bshara saying that all the time. We are not a classical opposition that wants to be part of the government. We don't want to be part of the government. We are going to present our rep to represent our people and not only about our Palestinians, 48, we want to go to, to represent our national issue and to be a moral voice and to, to, to start to try to change the, the, the Israeli um, uh, uh, the Israeli people, the Israeli citizens try 
to confront Israel from a democratic, to challenge Israel from a democratic and human point of view to talk about a state of all its citizens, like the states and all over the, over, the, over the world. So yes, I think the, the for the question, I think the, the sin of recommending guns led us to this discourse. And it was all the time since 48. It's not that, as I said, not that Israel is agreeing for us. All the time we had uh, politics that wanted to cooperate or whatever with the state. But now we are seeing the different that from our national group, from our like uh, parties that used to be part of the, you know, the consensus of the Palestinians are trying to do that. And I, I if I have one minute, like Amel said, the people are expecting from us to, to make a change if we are going to the Knesset. Of course, if we don't have... If we like, we are not. You got to lead, not to be led. Like we are, ha we we promised ourselves to have a, um, a a political project to change what's going on, not to be led by what the people want. Of course, the people will want us to bring them some resources, some changes, some achievements, as long as we don't promise them or they don't expect from us a, a structural change, a, a change, a bigger change. But if we promise if we initiate uh, a different uh, project, they will not wait from us to some million dollars here or some uh, whatever achievements, material achievements. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, Arin. Uh, can I, can has I the lesson, Amal, has the lesson been learned from the Gantz affair, Arab-wise? Let, let me, let me, uh, Khalil, let me, uh, sorry. Uh, relate to this point. First sure. of all, I think there is a lot of arrogance in what Arin said now about the public. Uh, I think that the, the Palestinian public in Israel is instinctively very wise and knows very much that they are Palestinians and they are- oh, uh, That's what I said. As long as you don't have no, wait, the national wait, wait. public, no, so no. then- No, because you said I am arrogant towards the yeah. No, no, uh, what, what, you, you sound, I know you're not arrogant, you sound arrogant, and, and I want to correct. I think as long I, as we don't have national project, they would expect from us material achievements. No, no, they know, they have, okay. they have, the, okay, the public. Let, let Amal finish his idea. The public has a national project, and the public knows, in Jdaidi and Tamra and Taibi and Shfa'amr and Nasri and so on, know very much, they have families in the refugee camps, they have families everywhere in the Arab world. They know very much that they are Palestinians and they want to change the entire Israeli system. People are opportunistic to a certain extent, but not always opportunistic. And we have to differentiate between strategy and tactics. We want to change, we want a strategic step. And I think uh, since we can, cannot bring uh, politicians from Sweden, we are dealing with Israeli politicians, whether you like it or not. If you only want to voice your vision about what should happen, why, why Knesset? Why go to the Knesset? You can do it from everywhere. Uh, I'm in the academia, I can say whatever I want. I don't want to go to the Knesset. I don't want to uh, limitations of the Knesset. I mean, this, this game of we go to the Knesset in order to be in the opposition only and voice our uh, uh, visions, you don't have to do it from the Knesset. If you go to the Knesset, you have to be aware of your strategy and uh, 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 subsequent tactics you need to take in order to achieve your goals, your strategic goals. Now, if uh, uh, the issue of, uh, of course, the moral issue is there. The Palestinian issue is a moral issue. And the conflict between Palestinians and Israelis have to do with morality, definitely. But there is politics in the middle. Morality is not there. It's not a metaphysical issue. Only we have to uh, uh, view and think about. It's a, a realistic thing. People suffer. In the in the in in the villages and the towns, and they are they suffer from the Israeli uh, policies because of being Palestinians. I mean, even if they forget being Palestinians, the Israeli government is enough there to remind them every day that they are Palestinians. So nobody needs to remind them they are the Palestinians. The Israelis are there to remind them. This is second thing. The, the, the third thing is they are there. I'm saying um, I, I don't have now, uh, uh, you know, it's not a button you have to push and there is no one formula that is right every, in every time. I think politics is about how to read the situation, how to read the, uh, 
map and know how to play according to the map in order to promote your interest. And the strategic interest is to gain a situation or win a situation in which you are able not only to gain, and I said it before, not only to gain resources, a million dollar here, a million dollar there. It's not the issue. That's what Netanyahu wants. That's what Netanyahu thinks. That's what guns think. That's what Lapid, by the way, also think. We can buy them. We can give them some resources. And, and that's enough. I think our public is not that stupid. Our public wants not to negotiate every time in order to get some resources. Our public wants to change the entire Israeli political uh, orientation, the entire Israeli political uh, uh, direction in order not to negotiate every time for some resources. They want to change policies. And in order to change policies, you need to be in a, in, in a situation where you can bring the king to, its, to his throne. And, and without, bringing the, without being able to bring the, the king to his throne, you have no power. And I think the joint list came close, very close to this place. Unfortunately, they did not manage to keep it together. And I don't want to accuse anybody here, but uh, 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 they did not manage as, as, as a leadership to, to, to keep it together in order to play this game now. Imagine, as I said, 15 seats now in this situation. Uh, uh, first of all, the entire allocation of seats in the Knesset would change and they would have much more power than only five seats that Mansour Abbas has. And they, will not, they would not have deepened the split within the community and enable Netanyahu actually to deepen the antagonism within the Palestinian community. Because it, the, the politics that Netanyahu followed is part of his fragmentation policy that he has been following for a long time. He did <clears> not want only to split the list. He wanted actually to lower the representation of the Arabs in the Knesset in order to make sure that his right wing parties win more seats. That's the strategy he followed. And I think we fell into the trap. Uh, Amira and Tamir, is what Amal uh, is suggesting doable in that Israeli system that you described earlier? Is the system amenable to Arab citizens, a minority, discriminated against, changing it in a significant way like Amal is suggesting? Not, not just for benefit, but inherently changing the system for the future. Amira and, and Tamir, go ahead if you have a comment on this. Uh, Amira, your microphone is up. Uh, <clears throat> so I will, I will refer to it. I, I can only say, uh, following uh, Antonio Gramsci, um, <laughs> the pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of the will. There you go. Um, we have lots of good reasons when we analyze the situation to believe that this task of uh, the Palestinians in Israel to unite again and to uh, shape and uh, make changes uh, faces the wall of uh, Jewish supremacy. Um, but at the, at the same time, uh, we cannot let this pessimism to stop us from uh, keep trying. Uh, and uh, maybe uh, the way to do it, as I uh, suggested earlier, uh, is to extend the uh, circles of political solidarity beyond the green line, to merge um, international pressure with internal dynamics in uh, the Palestinian society and also in the Jewish society in Israel and um, to keep going forward. Uh, Amira, would you like to add something? Yeah, it's... It certainly such a change would not be through the Knesset only. Uh, and even th there must be some, some, some international and Palestinian and uh, the remaining of the Israeli left-wing activism of all those parts in, 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 in uh, dimensions that we have not seen yet uh, in order to make Israelis, the Israeli, the, the, the average Israeli realize that this reality in which we live is not normal. And this is, uh, this is not, 
I don't see it. I don't see it as a as a as a mere f a prospect, but as a uh, and something that is happening soon. Uh, but something has something very deep and basic has to be shaked shaken uh, in this Israeli smugness about their uh, normalcy. Uh, so right now, neither in 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 the sixty seven occupied territory nor in. Uh, 48, do I see it a possibility to uh, uh, make uh, major changes? In a way, I see more, I see that if we manage to, to block something uh, in the Israeli expansion in the West Bank, uh, through The Hague, through uh, more activism, through boycott, through sanctions, uh, it might, make the Israelis think also about, uh, about uh, what's happening, uh, about the whole thing, about the whole picture. Uh, but again, I, I, I see a Palestinian, uh, Palestinian people in a very weak position now uh, and not creative, a leadership which is not creative and leadership which is an obstacle, unfortunately, in the, uh, in here, the West, in 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 Gaza, West Bank, uh, that is also very much um, is opting more for its own nomenclatura and the position of its own nomenclatura than trying to uh, to change the rules of the game. Uh, but like you, I mean, I do want to hope. I do want to hope that uh, something must happen. So I also know that some. Things happen when we don't expect them, uh, but it doesn't mean that we don't have uh, that we should uh, we should uh, give up building and 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 planting those seeds that might uh, make a change later. Uh, Irene, we have a question from uh, uh, Dr. Suleiman Abu Badr uh, asking about the uh, the current seeds. Uh, it looks like between uh, six plus four plus five people in different parties, we're going to go back to about 14 or 15 Arab Knesset members. Is there any way that one could expect in, in, in the logic of this hope that Amira referred to, some kind of least common denominator to emerge among these 15 Arab members of the Knesset to make a difference? Or is it a... Yeah, to, is this a chance to what? I didn't understand. A your chance answer. to have a least common denominator among all these Muslim Arabs Muslim. in different parties. Oh, okay, thank you. To work okay. together yeah. uh, on, on a common agenda to realize some of what Amal suggests. Yeah, uh, no, actually, I don't think for me Arabs, uh, like it's Arab politics. When I say, like when we say feminists, we don't mean women. When I say Arab politics or Palestinian politics, I mean the, those who who support, like for me, Alfred Kasif, of course, much, much, much more than uh, in, um, part of my broad national project or, or democratic project, let's say, because the word national would, could be misunderstood or misinterpreted in the Palestinian context. I mean national, of course. Again, it's for, for me, Alfred Kasif, of course, much more close, closer than, uh, than Arabs in Zionist party. So, so no, for me, Arab or Jewish in, the, in, the, in, the, in any Zionist party, he, is committed to, to the agenda of this party. Like, I don't expect Abtissam uh, Marani, for example, who is, was now elected in the Labour Party, to be different than the politics of the Labour Party, who, you, who the Labour Party was in the Knesset now, in the, in the government with Netanyahu. Like, they didn't change their, يعني, not to talk about their historical crimes and historical project against our people and against against all the يعني, it's they did the, the all the, the what happened for us since 48 or before 48 let's take that i just cited what what mirav Michaeli, the head of this party said they are part of the israeli they want israel to be more liberal more looks democratic more democratic and jewish whatever but it's the same lab, uh, um, labor party so of course no i don't see arabs in zionist parties as their uh, allies all right. Uh, I, I read a quote this morning uh, from Avi Is Isakharov. Uh, he uh, was writing ab about the results uh, of, of the elections and he said, so if I understood it correctly, the coalition of Bibi, Ben Gvir, 
uh, Smotrich and a few other well-known, I guess he was uh, being sarcastic, Arab lovers, is currently at the mercy of a party from the house of the creator of the Muslim Brotherhood. Pleasure, he, he said. Uh, Amal, <laughs> how can uh, <laughs> some, somebody uh, work within that context to really effect change uh, for the benefit of, of, of the Arab community in Israel? If those people well, are going to be part of the coalition now, yeah. Well, well uh, let, let me let me not sound <clears throat> as if I stand fully behind uh, Masur Abbas. I would like no. to be clear. Uh, I'm not. I'm saying uh, we that the, the, the possibility opening the possibilities for uh, such a strategy should have been the uh, 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 the step taken by the joint list. Now, of course, there is, and I said before, what's going on now is, is, is a deep, is a result or, or a reflection of a deep process taking place in Israeli society. There is a, a clear trend to the right. Netanyahu has legitimized now the Kahana party into the Knesset. <clears throat> it's a clear racist party, but it's not the only racist party in the Israeli political system. The entire Israeli debate, whether Arabs are legitimate or not legitimate to support a majority in the Knesset, is racist. So what I'm saying is, if we accept this, this means that uh, uh, all Zionist parties, including the Haredi party, who are not Zionist, are racist. So should we stay home? Uh, it's, it's an option. It's one option. The issue is, are the Arab parties willing to say the following? Either we illegitimate and part of what's going on, or we stay home. I mean, the way the Arab parties are playing the game now, or so far at least, has been legitimizing the system without gaining anything. Because you play, you stay in the opposition, you're trying to win here here here. some resources from the, in, in the places. And thereby, Israel can portray itself as the only democracy in the Middle East. And here the Arabs, you know, play the game. They... Uh, uh, they are part of uh, of us, and we are. They are tolerated and can express themselves and look at this and that. I think the price we are paying so far, we paid so far, is 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 heavy, and it has to be uh, has to be changed. Uh, we don't want to be to, to be part of the game only in order to uh, whitewash the Israeli market. We want to put clear uh, uh, conditions. We want to be to have stipulations. Uh, on the game, either we end the game and legitimate and are able to influence the game, or we are outside the game. Now, so far, you know, there are only one third or even less than one third in the, in the Palestinian community saying, you know, boycotting the elections ideologically. This is also problematic in my view, because it's not either or. I mean, opening options in other way, <clears throat> in order to be in and influence or otherwise uh, boycott completely is, I think, uh, also a strategy that has to be taken in, in, in consideration. But the moment you're in, you have to be able to play the game in, in, in a way <clears throat> that enables you to have the right impact. Not any partnership with the coalition is accepted for me. Uh, as I said, I, I again, hypothetically, if uh, the joint list has been uh, 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 together, and 15 seats or 14 seats with another, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 Arab representative in, in merit, for instance, who might agree to such a strategy saying, you know, that Bengvir is out and uh, this and this out, we are in, either we or nobody. This would have changed the rules of the game. Now, I know there is a very deep uh, uh, opposition within the Jewish society uh, against such an option. I just came from a class where I discussed the result of the election and some of the students said something, you know, very uh, clear about uh, their unwillingness to see the, uh, uh, the Arab parties part of uh, the coalition or at least supporting the coalition from the outside or by what is called negative uh, vote. Uh, I know the issue is I don't think that people with privileges will uh, give uh, 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 give up their privileges 
uh, by their will. They have to be forced to do so. And only in a position, we are talking politics. We are not talking, you know, uh, now politics doesn't mean there's no morality, there's no uh, ideology, there's no uh, limits. But if we are talking politics, you have to know how to play the game in order to be able uh, uh, to do so. And uh, you have to start in your own house. You have to start in, own, in your own politics. And I think what I, I'm going to do a comparison that is very, may sound very problematic, but I think it's, uh, it's true to be made. What happened in 2006, 2007 between Fatah and Hamas and the split which was orchestrated by the strategy of Sharon by evacuating Gaza and actually uh, 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 enabling what happened and deepening the split is happening within the Palestinians in Israel now between the Islamic party and the rest, uh, uh, orchestrated by Netanyahu. And, uh, but Netanyahu is, let's say, our rival, our enemy. Why play according to his game. I mean, if you don't understand what he's trying to do, and you are willing to overcome uh, this strategy with a counter strategy. So what, why are you in this position? Why are you leading? And I agree with that. I mean, leadership has to lead, but cannot lead democratically without taking the sentiment of the public into consideration. Because all, at least the research we, we uh, ran uh, at Tel Aviv University, uh, 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 when asking the uh, Arab public, what is the most important uh, factor in uh, in the party you uh, in, in uh, that causes you to support a certain party? The first thing is not that they are Arabs. It's not that they represent my ideology. It's not that they uh, uh, look like me. The first thing is actually trust. Trust that I can trust them to do actually the best, uh, uh, to follow the best policy possible or the strategy possible in order to represent my interests. Now, if this is the main motivation for voting, uh, you cannot ignore what the Arab public wants and what the Arab public uh, thinks. And the Arab leadership has not been creative and innovative enough in order to follow this lead. My view. And it has to be the price, by the way. I think we cannot let them go without paying the price for what happened yesterday. All right. Let's end the program today with a macro uh, question, <clears throat> question that I would like to address to all four of you. Uh, if the results uh, are, uh, are approved by the end of the week, uh, and what we see today is it, and a government is uh, formed on, under Netanyahu. Uh, he's asked to form the next government based on these numbers. Uh, what if he's indicted? And uh, what would happen then? Would he have to resign? Uh, would the Likud have to replace him? Uh, so let's kind of explore that from uh, your perspective. Tamir, the question was actually addressed to you, but we'll open the... Uh, question to all four, you know, all four speakers. So let's start with them. Well, um, as I see the numbers, I do not see how Netanyahu form a government without snatching some of the uh, uh, members of uh, Gidon Saar or Kahol Avan, uh, Blue and White. This is the only option for him to do it. Um, and- he, You don't think he can get 61 just from the right wing? No, the, it, it is not there. Right now, mm -hmm. he has right now he has only fifty nine, and it is possible that he will have even less uh, when uh, everything will be uh, count. But this is what that includes Bennett. Yeah, it, uh, it, yeah. now with Bennett he has only fifty nine. I see, and uh, he might have even less. But um, this is a. Uh, how I see it, and you know, uh, I would say it is very dangerous to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> but I will, but I will make a risk here. Um, I do not think that Netanyahu is going anywhere. He's going to try to break the alliances with the other parties. Second line of defense for him is to, uh, to launch a, a Trump style campaign 
of uh, fraud of uh, allegations, he will not go peacefully because he's going to jail if he's going peacefully. Now, the rule of law in Israel, I think, is weaker than in the United States. I do not think that the uh, Israeli system will be able to endure to resist uh, such a pressure uh, by Netanyahu. And uh, so I do not see him um, leaving the scene um, very soon. Um, so um, we might enter a very ugly period um, in Israeli politics, but who know knows, maybe from this crisis, uh, it will shake up the system and some of the changes we hope to see might emerge from it. So um, let's wait and see. Thanks, Tamir. Amira. I'm also reluctant to, to prophesize about the future <laughs> uh, and even the near future. And let's not forget uh, that they still have to count the soldiers' uh, votes. That very, that I think can add a, add, add a mandate or two to the right wing. Uh, so, and also to the religion, uh, one, one of the religious parties. The, the even the, the the Zionist religious party. So it's still uh, fluid, very fluid. But uh, I think that, that in a way we were caught in this uh, in the game of Netanyahu that he wants that he has managed to make things revolve only around him. And uh, what I see, especially here in the West Bank, I mean, the system and the and the and the, what's happening, is much bigger than the doing of one person. It's really a, a, an establishment. It's it's an establishment that is geared to a certain goal, um, and it doesn't need a pilot. It is. Uh, it has become a, a kind of a of a. a Pilotless zanane, mazlat, drone. It doesn't need it. It 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 has a whole a whole tradition and 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 roots and uh, bureaucrats, uh, an army of bureaucrats who make this thing work. Um, and I think the same thing in Israel. So I don't know. Maybe maybe at the sir, if he if. If the court, I agree that the court here is, is and the democratic also, democratic traditions are much weaker than in the States. So uh, we, we, we often compare Trump to, to, to Netanyahu, but there was a resistance uh, to Trump at the end that uh, when he started to, to uh, say that, the, uh, that the, um, there was, the, the, the elections were falsified, so there was a clear message and we don't have this clear voice now. But if Likud people will see that they are in danger of losing their positions, I don't know, this also might happen. I don't think that Tsar, even though he didn't get a big, uh, uh, big number of, of uh, supporters, uh, still he represents a certain tendency. Uh, then what, what I really want to say is that uh, with or without Netanyahu, we are facing the same problems uh, uh, and the same challenges. Okay. Uh, Arin, one minute. <laughs> okay. So, so since I think any, any con new constellation will be only right, so I will not discuss it more. I will use my one minute to, 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 to say what I think that we should do as Palestinians. I think we should re rethink and re reevaluate our situations that made us like make this compromise with compromising our basic uh, values and supporting um, and trying to be part of the Israeli game. As for what Amal said, I think our people, our community is smart. They are smart and they are wise and they are practical also. If we sell them this uh, uh, the campaign that we will make uh, achievements, 
and we cannot make achievements because any constellation will not take us. So they will not, they will, they know that's why they did not vote for us. Okay. And, but if we sell them our uh, different project and, and, and a different plan, they would respect us if we try to be more. Uh, it, like, I think it's not accidentally that Balad is the project I'm finishing, Khalil. It, it was charismatic and um, attracted the people and people uh, agreed with us at the time that people were thinking that the Palestinian issue is finished and Rabin is, is, is very good with us and we succeeded. So I think the people are smart. But but uh, but we have to lead them, and we ha- that's why we should we call the 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 parties our leaders, and not to be led again. Uh, thank you, Amal. Okay. Thank you, Amal. You have the okay. final. Yeah, word. I think. Yeah, I think we should wait until we know the end results. It's very hard to expect what could happen because of four four hundred fifty thousand votes of mostly soldiers and diplomats, which are usually distributed uh, to the right rather than to the center left. This could change the entire uh, uh, reality. The whole game, yeah. Yeah, uh, the whole game uh, may, may get Netanyahu the majority he is looking for. The issue is two, two, uh, uh, two challenges he would have. What would uh, Bennett demand from him in order to mm-hmm. enter the government? Because the, uh, Bennett is preparing himself to become prime minister at some point, so it's going to depend on that. And the second is uh, what Ben Gvir and Smotrich will demand. Uh, otherwise, if they demand too much, Netanyahu may manipulate the system in order to go for other elections. I have an interesting quick question. If Netanyahu ends up with, with uh, 60 votes, does uh, Mansour Abbas, uh, is he faced with the fact in, in, to endorse Netanyahu, or can he abstain and still Netanyahu will serve? Yeah, That's abstain and Netanyahu was, yeah, yeah. Uh, and Netanyahu doesn't want him actually uh, to openly support him. It's enough that he negatively abstain. votes, which means abstain. Abstain is enough. The, the other side has no majority, and that's it. This is enough for him. But for that, we will have to pay, to, to pay a heavy price. Let's wait and see. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all uh, our four uh, speakers. That was an excellent uh, discussion and uh, very dynamic. We did not solve uh, all the problems we would have <laughs> liked like to, to, to solve, but at least we raised uh, all the important issues uh, which makes it a very, very complex uh, situation. Uh, Israeli po- electoral politics has never been uh, dull uh, or, or simple, and we got a simple, just a sample of this. Uh, thank you to our audience uh, for staying uh, put with us, even though we went over time a bit, and uh, I thought the discussion was uh, worthwhile. I didn't want to stop it, so and, and I, I hope you did enjoy Uh, more questions and answers. I apologize to those who we have a lot of more questions uh, that we didn't get to. Uh, Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Thank you again to our speakers and, and to our audience. And we hope to see you again in a future event.